Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to be here with you today and have an opportunity to speak with you about gene therapy for MSA and a study that we're trying to get launched for patients with MSA. Uh, here's an overview of what I want to talk about today. And the first thing I'd like to do is uh, just really speak to who AskBio is. I'm sure many of you here today have probably never heard of AskBio, so I just want to give some background for, for about the company itself. Uh, I'd like to then delve into what is gene therapy, but also what isn't gene therapy to help really dispel some of the myths that may be out there about what exactly gene therapy may be. And then I want to talk about how we actually do gene therapy, but particularly how we do this for brain diseases like MSA. And then why are we even thinking about doing gene therapy for something like MSA? And to wrap up, I want to talk about how to participate in clinical trials uh, like this one and, and many others. So just to get started, just some background here on AskBio. So the, the long name here, you can see here is Asclepios Biopharmaceutical. So this is a gene therapy company that's headquartered uh, here in the United States in North Carolina. Uh, but there are offices in Ohio and uh, many other countries in the EU that you can see listed here. Um, this was founded by um, Jude Samulski back in 2001. He's really been a big pioneer in the field of gene therapy and really revolutionized uh, the, the field itself. And based off of his expertise and knowledge, the, the gene therapy uh, that's been developed by Jude Samulski has now been implemented in all of the other gene therapies that have been approved so far from a variety of different diseases. And because of this, ASPA has really emerged as a, a real big leader, uh, next, uh, next generation adenovirus gene therapies, and really pioneering almost every element of design. Now, one other thing I'd like to point out today is that uh, a lot of what I'm talking about today are gene therapies that have not been approved by the FDA. Uh, these are still experimental and in the stage of research, and so I just wanted to make sure that, that was really clear up front. So just a few more things about AskBio itself. So AskBio, again, has really been innovative in the field of gene therapy. AskBio was the first to clone AAB in order to be able to use it as a part of a therapy. And I'll talk a bit more about what AAB is coming up. Um, but also the first to treat things like Duchenne muscular dystrophy and Pompe disease, and uh, one of the first to put AAB into the brain as well. And able to do all of this because of this, uh, this really unique toolbox that's now been developed by ASBio to really help uh, really push forward and pioneer in the field of gene therapy. And by having this really uh, wide toolbox, this has allowed ASBio to really uh, develop gene therapies for a variety of diseases. So including muscle diseases like you see here, but also congestive heart failure and a variety of other neurologic diseases, including multiple system atrophy. And with all of this being supported by the ability to manufacture these gene therapies to really make it robust a uh, program. Now, if anyone's interested in AskBio and wants to go look any deeper, um, it'll be very quick to find out that AskBio was recently um, acquired by Bayer. Uh, so the AskBio is now operating independently as a subsidiary of Bayer starting back in uh, December of 2020 and is now really the cornerstone of Bayer's cell and gene therapy platform. Now, to dig in a bit more into exactly what is gene therapy, I really want to first describe what isn't gene therapy. There's a lot of misnomers and I wanna make sure that we can put some of these questions to rest right up front. So to be very clear, gene therapy is not gene editing. So this is not going into your, your DNA and taking out or changing any pieces of the DNA. And uh, this also includes things like CRISPR. This is not CRISPR. This is also not cloning. We're not making another Dolly the sheep. This is not how you make designer babies. And this is not stem cells. So though these are important features, this is not what we're talking about today. If you have questions about this, happy to answer them later. Um, but again, these are a lot of things that people often ask me um, up front when I start to talk about gene therapy. So what is gene therapy? So if you pardon me a bit and let's go back to classroom for just a little bit. Um, we wanna start with what are genes? So genes are the instructions for our cells to help them grow and stay healthy throughout the, their life cycle. It really helps to think of genes as um, like a blueprint. And just to know that genes are our DNA and our DNA is our genes. Now, what cells do with this DNA or this instruction manual that we have in our DNA is to then use this information to make new proteins. So what are proteins? Proteins are uh, made in order to signal within the cell to tell the cell that it's healthy or what it needs. And it also, our, our proteins are really critical in many other functions that help keep the cell alive. 
Now, what happens with gene therapy is we're actually harnessing or taking advantage of this normal natural function within each individual cell to then make a protein based off of a gene that we, we want to be in the cell. And that protein then acts like our medicine. So how exactly do you get genes into brain cells? This is actually a big hurdle um, that had to be overcome and is still being developed to some extent because it's really hard to do these sorts of things specifically in the brain. So what is gene therapy? So with gene therapy, we're taking a new copy of DNA or our gene, the, specifically the type of gene that we want, and using this as a new way of treating a variety of diseases. And to be clear, this is not just for diseases that are known to have a genetic origin. This is really for a variety of um, diseases that may have multiple causes. By taking a healthy gene, we need to then package it so that it can be delivered to the parts of the body that we want. And in the case of gene therapy, we use an emptied out or shelled out viral vector. And that helps to keep the healthy gene in place so that we can get it into the right cells that are then the cells that are actually impacted by the disease itself. Uh, what we're talking about today, our viral vector or our, our packaging, we're using AAV. So this is adeno-associated virus. This is used exclusively by AskBio and um, by many other companies as well. And I think it's important to note that this AAV is, has been modified, so it itself cannot actually cause infection. So let me tell you a little bit more about AAV. So what is this? This adeno-associated uh, vector. So this is a, a good way to think of it as like our envelope or our packaging for, for our gene. AAV2 is the most common one that's used in brain. There are several types of AAV, but we really like AAV2 because it's really good at getting those genes into the brain cells specifically. Not all of the vectors are as good at getting into brain cells. Now, the other big benefit is AAV2 specifically has been safely used in many neurologic diseases and in several other types of trials, including things like Parkinson's disease, which is very similar to multiple system atrophy. The other reason we really like AAV and specifically for brain disorders is that the effect is really durable and it's very long lasting when it's given directly to the brain. So let me try to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Um, so again, we have our DNA or our gene that we see here in purple, and we need to package it into this vector or this yellow uh, shape here. And I think it helps to think of it this way. So think of your DNA, your gene, like a letter that we wanna get delivered to a cell. So we have our letter here, we need to put it in the envelope. Now, when we put everything together, we now need to get this whole package delivered to the address that we want. In, in many cases, this is delivered in a variety of ways, but for us, we actually need, like our mail truck is effectively surgery uh, to the brain. Now we get our package or our letter delivered right into the brain and it's the brain cells themselves that then read the message. And just like we see here inside the cell, the message is sent, it's taken up into the cell, the cell reads it, and then it makes the proteins uh, that we were just talking about. And it's really the proteins that do sort of the business end of, of the gene for us. So to look at this in a slightly different way, we have a gene, again, this is our DNA, and this is uh, the part that we really need to get in now into our package or our vector. So this is like our envelope. Um, this is then enters into the, our vector and, and we, this happens basically in a, a tube. And then we have our full package that's now put together. And now we use surgery to deliver it right to the parts of the body or the cells that we are affected by the disease that we wanna treat. When the vector is normally just naturally taken up into the cell, and with that, the, the actual package itself is dissolved, it goes away, and all we're left with then is just the gene. And the gene is handled the same way that the cells handle genes and DNA normally. As you can see, it's reading the, the instructions for the gene. And in this case, and what we're talking about today, the instructions are for the cell to make a protein called GDNF. GDNF is a really important protein that, to help maintain the health and well-being of many cells, but particularly um, dopamine neurons in the brain specifically, which is a, a potential big benefit for something like multiple system atrophy. But why are we thinking about gene therapy for MSA? Well, I probably don't have to tell anyone here today that there really are very few treatment options available for patients with MSA. And what's out there is really mostly to address the symptoms and not necessarily the disease itself. 
And as a reminder, gene therapy is not just for genetic diseases. And in fact, we were looking at uh, something like Parkinson's disease as well that has many genes involved. So this, this is a ripe opportunity for something like uh, gene therapy and MSA. Um, what we're proposing to do in this study I'm about to speak to you about is to really address the root cause of MSA, to really try to get at what's driving the progression of MSA and not just treating the symptoms. So a very different type of, of treatment. And a big benefit of doing gene therapy is that this is a one-time treatment that we expect to be long lasting because it's delivered right into the brain. Now, the landscape out there right now for the therapies that are available for MSA patients is, is limited. There's no MSA specific treatments available right now. And unlike other things like, like Parkinson's, there's no viable surgical options out there right now either. The medications can provide some benefits, specifically the same Parkinson's medications that Parkinson's patients use. Um, typically, however, this, this doesn't last for very long and tends to be kind of temporary. And so what ends up happening is we really have a lot of symptomatic management and supportive care that we um, are able to provide for our patients. But this is a big part of the reason why we're looking for new ways of treating MSA more effectively. So let me tell you a little bit more about AB2 GDNF. So this is the gene therapy that we're looking at um, applying in M MSA. Um, GDNF is a really critical uh, growth factor um, and particularly for dopamine cells themselves. It turns out that when we're young uh, and even in, in infanthood, the levels of GDNF that we all have in our brains normally is actually very high. And typically, as we get older, our GDNF levels tend to drop off over time. Um, but a little bit of GDNF is still needed in the adult brain. And this is really important for just maintaining the health and survival of these cells. And what we're hoping uh, with uh, this sort of approach for something like MSA is that GDNF, because it has that growth factor potential, will actually alter the course of MSA and not just treat the symptoms. So why, why GDNF specifically? So working with a, a colleague of ours from the NIH, uh, Dave Goldstein, you see listed here, um, he's been working with patients with MSA at, at NIH for many years and has had the opportunity to um, take advantage of patients who have passed away and looking at their brain tissues so to help understand what is going on in the brains of patients with MSA. And in fact, what he found is um, looking really here at the, on the right with this bar graph, he looked at patients with MSA and compared them to patients that did not have MSA, looking at their brain tissue and looking at a specific part of the brain called the putamen. When he was looking at these, these two groups, he found that patients with MSA had about a 76% loss of GDMF in their putamen as compared to patients who did not have MSA. And on top of that, there was about a 90% drop of dopamine. And this makes a lot of sense to, uh, that there's very little dopamine for patients with MSA, because that explains a lot of uh, why patients have uh, Parkinson's-like type of symptoms that show up. And what I found to be really interesting actually is that there are animal models of MSA that when you look in these same brain regions, they also have low GDNF levels. And in fact, when GDNF levels are restored, and they can do this in a variety of ways, when you boost the GDNF levels, the function of these animals also improves. So now I know that mice do not equal humans, and we don't know for sure how this will translate into people. Um, but this evidence really kind of coming together is very encouraging to continue this approach uh, as, uh, for GDNF gene therapy as a strategy for MSA treatment. So a bit more about the uh, ASPIO's MSA program specifically. So we know that there's a big loss of GDNF in MSA patients. And it's, there's a lot of reason to think that that loss of GDNF is actually contributing to the progression and the continued um, advancement of, of MSA. With this investigational GDNF gene therapy, we can take advantage of the cells that are still there that haven't been killed, up, die, haven't died from MSA and are still working okay and have them take this GDNF gene therapy and then start using this to, to make more GDNF. The thought is that with more GDNF available uh, within the brain, that this will have the ability to restore the health of the sick or the dying cells, those that are still there but are not working as well because of MSA. And by doing this, we're, the hope is that we could open up the possibility to really change the course of MSA while also improving some of the symptoms. 
So how do we exactly do gene therapy? This was actually a question my mom asked me. And so I always bring this up because it's a, it's a really important uh, point of what it is that we're doing. So how do we do this? So I wanna take a minute and talk about uh, what we're doing for delivery. This is MRI monitoring during our surgical delivery. So to make no bones about it, this is brain surgery. And unlike a lot of other brain surgeries, this is done directly in the MRI machine. So once patients have been screened and we have a very rigorous screening process for this study, and those who qualify um, are invited to then participate in this gene therapy study. Um, this, this, the AV2 GDNF is then administered by a one-time uh, monitored procedure. So again, this is done directly in the MRI machine. And part of the reason we do this is that with the MRI machine going and taking images, as soon as one finishes, another image is, is beginning. And this allows us to very precisely guide small uh, hollow tubes directly and very precisely to the part of the brain that we want to go to, um, to make sure that we're very precisely delivering the gene therapy where we want and not in other places. This also really allows the surgeon to customize exactly how much of the structure inside the brain that can get filled. And this really tailors the infusion for every single individual. And another big benefit is that this technique has been used for about 10 years in a variety of other brain diseases. And so we have a lot of experience and experienced surgeons to help us perform this. So what does this look like? So um, we take a very small, thin, hollow tube, and then we very slowly advance it and progress it into a part of the brain called the putamen. So this round structure here is the putamen. And then as this tube is being advanced or pushed through to the putamen, it then, it, there's also an infusion of our gene therapy. So the green that you see here is our gene therapy. And what we can do by being able to watch this in real time with the MRI machine, we're able to make sure that the gene therapy is going in all the places that we want it to and can fill up the structure. And this is why we call it a shape fitting type of procedure. Um, and again, by going and working with um, using this needle to go through the, the back of the head, this actually has really cut down on the surgical time uh, to make this an even more feasible procedure. So what this looks like in sort of picture formats, uh, this is an MRI image of, from three different angles of looking at the brain. And this is after what uh, a very slow MRI monitored infusion of our gene therapy to that area called the putamen. So all the areas you see here outlined in red, those are, that's where the putamen is in this individual. And the white or this really bright area, this is the gene therapy that's been infused. And so the goal here is to really fill up the putamen with our gene therapy, because we've had some experience in other diseases to suggest that the more we fill up the structure, the better the outcomes will be for, for the patients. So um, what we've done is, again, we take MRIs continuously throughout this procedure. And so uh, what you're about to see is many, many of these images stitched together to make a, what looks like a video. So I think it's important for me to point out that though this looks very quick, this is actually many, many hours that are now been compressed in just a few seconds. So I want, I want you to pay attention to is this kind of darker gray blob here and this one here. These, this is the putamen inside a patient's brain. And what you're going to see is this is the hollow tube that's going into the putamen. And you can see this white dot here will start to grow. And this is the first part of the infusion on this side of the brain. And you'll see that this begins on, on both sides. And again, this is just a single pass of the catheter through the, the back of the head. So again, you can see this white spot growing and filling up. And as the cannula is being advanced, there's an infusion, it advances and there's another infusion. And the goal here is to very precisely and neatly fill up the putamen. And what we've been able to do is get well over 50% of the putamen covered um, by doing this type of technique. And again, we think this is important because th this will then mean better clinical outcomes for patients who receive this. So um, just a little bit more information on this particular clinical trial. Um, this is uh, registered here on clinicaltrials.gov. You can see the, the clinical trial number here. Um, for people to be eligible for this particular study, there has to be a diagnosis of MSA. 
Um, ideally, uh, we're looking for patients that have mostly Parkinson's-like symptoms because of how we think this will work and how, where we are delivering this gene therapy. We think that patients with this type of MSA are going to do a bit better. Um, we're also looking for patients who are between 35 and 75 years old and less than four years from diagnosis. Again, because we're working with the growth factor, we have good reason to think that if we can catch someone with MSA a little bit earlier in the, their, their course of the disease, um, that there's more there to be preserved and there's better room for better benefit with uh, GDNF gene therapy. Um, we are looking for patients that don't have significant issues with depression or memory impairment and are not wheelchair dependent. Um, so if you're found to be eligible to participate in this kind of study, the involvement's really intensive. Um, this includes not only the one-time surgical delivery of the gene therapy, but also then entails a commitment to lots of visits over three years with a movement source specialist. Um, and so that also then translates to a lot of close neurologic monitoring. So the study is not yet enrolling, though we do have, hope to have this up and running by, by the end of the year. And if you have more information, I would invite you to look at this at clinicaltrials.gov. Um, in the meantime, we're also looking to launch another study. This is uh, what we're calling a pre-gene therapy study or a natural history study um, to really help us get ready for the next phase of, of these studies. Um, for this particular study, we're looking at both Parkinson's and MSA. Um, this makes a lot of sense since both of these diseases are typically seen at the same movement disorders office. And in fact, as many of you may know, MSA and Parkinson's can look very similar, especially at the early stages of disease that we're looking at. So again, we're targeting an MSA population that's very early in stages, so less than four years from diagnosis, with mostly Parkinson's-like symptoms and still able to walk independently, um, though the CIS devices are still okay. And what we're aiming to do with this particular study is to monitor changes of, in exams and other assessments over time. So this includes just your usual typical neurologic exam that you would do at your neurologist's office on a normal, normal visit, but also other MSA specific assessments so that we can have an idea of how MSA be, may be affecting you and your, your daily activities at home, but also looking at an MRI brain and uh, blood and spinal fluid biomarkers to really help us understand how this disease changes over time. And to also to inform us to make sure that we're designing these studies in the best way possible for uh, MSA patients down the road. So with all that said, I would ask everyone here to at least consider joining the fight against MSA and do this really by helping us participating in a clinical trial. It turns out that many patients probably even sitting here talking, listening to this today, um, that are you know, interested in thinking about joining a clinical trial. Yet when you look across the board, it's about less than 10% of patients actually sign up for a study. And we can't ever really advance the science or our, our treatments for these things like MSA um, unless we all pitch in. And so we could use all the help we can get. So please think about um, participating in a study. So how exactly would you do that? So I would recommend that everybody check out clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, this is a, go a government website that um, is now required by law that every legitimate clinical trial must be registered on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so please, if you're considering not even just this study, but any clinical trial, please consider going to clinicaltrials.gov and, and make sure that this trial is registered there. Um, this website can be a little bit difficult to maneuver, so I would also recommend um, the people to check out the Fox Trial Finder. So you might be thinking, Michael J. Fox Foundation, that's a Parkinson's group. Well, yes, that's true. Um, it turns out they actually have a really nice um, area just for MSA, and they've done a good job of um, pulling together all the MSA studies um, that are also located trial finder, and this can be a little bit easier for some patients to use. So I would encourage everyone to go check that out as well. And lastly, um, if you want more information about this particular study, I would encourage you to talk to your neurologist. Um, there is a Q&A session later, and, and please come and ask your questions. Uh, feel free to email me here. This is my, my email address at AskBio. And if you're still interested in more about AskBio or want to sign up for our newsletter to stay on top of the progress of our studies, please email us at askfirst at askbio.com. Um, and that's it. So thank you so much. I look forward to your questions and uh, talk to you later.